study done by uh, Adam Sonneman, senior author. He was looking at predictive biomarkers to Paxitaxel, and he was looking at both breast cancer and gliomas, and they discovered sort of this no novel biomarker potentially. How many breast cancer patients are typically treated with Paxitaxel? So Paclitaxel is one of the most widely used drugs for both early stage disease and advanced metastatic breast cancer. And <clears throat> to quantitate that, that you know, the patients with early stage disease are probably two thirds of our patients. Now, not all of them get chemotherapy, but if they do, a taxane is a very common uh, component of their therapy. And in the metastatic disease setting, patients will undergo a series of therapies over the course of their illness. They don't have a curative therapy, but taxanes are always very prominent among the therapies that we do utilize. So is there any way to give us some sense of those patients that receive that, that do not respond? Is it 20%, 50%, 60%, 80? Right, so in early stage disease, we don't know who responds because there's nothing that we're following. We're basically, of course, treating microscopic disease that can't be evaluated. So we judge the effectiveness of the therapy by whether the patients are alive, you know, five years, 10 years, or do they have recurrent disease. But in the setting of metastatic disease where we use imaging as a way of judging the effect of the therapy, we use taxane therapy usually as a single agent, um, and we usually give patients at least three months of therapy and then we repeat the scans. So we're following measures of, as an example, somebody has something in their liver or their lung, is that disease remaining stable? Is it shrinking? Or in the worst scenario, is there more of the disease rather than less? So with that said, probably depending on where the therapy is used, probably about 30 to 40% of patients respond. Um, and the reason I have a caveat there is because patients who've been heavily pretreated, say before they get a taxane, or for that matter, any therapy, the probability of them responding diminishes with each subsequent therapy. If you treat them early with any drug, they're more likely to be responsive. But as a ballpark figure, probably about a third to 40% of patients respond, which means that the imaging studies change in some way in a favorable way. And what is the severity of toxicities that are associated with this particular therapy? With taxane therapy in general, the predictable things that you're gonna see in patients is their blood counts are affected, which is common to many chemotherapy drugs. But the thing that most patients worry about, and physicians as well, is that over time, they may develop peripheral neuropathy, which could be a numbness or tingling in the fingertips or toes, and in some patients it becomes prohibitive, which is problematic, particularly if a patient is benefiting from the therapy, you have to stop it because of side effects. But the flip side is true too, if you don't know that a patient is benefiting from therapy, they may still experience those mm -hmm. side effects. And you can't tell them with certainty that, you know, put up with it because you're getting something beneficial as a result. As a clinician, would you find a enrichment of response biomarker helpful, or do you think it's a hindrance to treatment? Well, if you had a validated tool that you could mm -hmm. confidently say, predicts who is going to benefit from whatever therapy, we would find that highly useful. We're in an era, particularly uh, as, it re as it relates to breast cancer, where goals are either to escalate and select patients with respect to therapy, meaning if you have other therapies that can further reduce the risk of recurrence, yes, add them. But on the other hand, we know, particularly in early stage disease, that we probably over-treat a significant fraction of patients. So if there are tools that allow us to de-escalate therapy, and not use treatments that aren't needed or that a patient won't benefit from, those would clearly be beneficial tools to have available to us. But the key is, can we validate these things? I want you to elaborate a little bit on that. In your mind, what does it take to validate a biomarker for clinical use? <laughs> so validation, you know, we want to be able to demonstrate clinical utility. So in in medical oncology and at least in breast cancer, we have therapies that we use and we judge their effectiveness downstream, meaning after the patient's been on a therapy, certainly in advanced disease by looking at relatively crude tools, which are imaging studies. Mm -hmm. Does something get smaller? Does it stay the same? Or does it get bigger and the latter is not a good thing? 
if you had, before you even treated the patient, a tool that predicted with some certainty that this patient will benefit from drug X, you would be more inclined to use that drug and avoid it in patients where that wasn't the case. We've had in the past um, a variety of assays going back 20, 30 years where you could in vitro look at a piece of tumor tissue from the patient, expose it to different chemotherapy drugs, and then utilize that information to make treatment decisions, which looked good, but when it actually came to doing it in vivo in the patient, it didn't always pan out to be corresponding to what you saw in the Petri dish. So those in vitro um, assays weren't fully validated when you got to patients. So what we'd like to see, I think, if you were to use such a tool, um, if it were available, is if you were gonna treat a patient group that was otherwise similar with drug X, you would probably want to have that predictive tool incorporated into the trial and have an endpoint that was clinical and then you could look back on whether or not the um, assay that you were using to predict the response to that therapy uh, showed the same effect that you see clinically when you look at, say, x-rays or CT scans or whatever imaging tool you're using. Do you think retrospective analysis of, let's say, a large cohort would be sufficient to move forward in a clinical or do you, in a clinical way, or do you think it would always need to be prospectively validated in the context of biomarker, received drug, not received drug? Well, I think in order for it to have widespread adoption, ultimately you'll have to have something that's prospective. But one way that you could look at it if it were available, there have been innumerable large clinical trials done over the years, and I, I'm speaking largely of breast cancer, um, where patients in the early stage setting, so that's what we refer to as adjuvant therapy, where you're treating microscopic disease, you're not getting x-rays, you're not getting CT scans, and they're being treated with chemotherapy recipe X versus chemotherapy recipe Y, and what's the outcome? So you go five years down the line, what fraction of patients are free of disease, you know, one treatment arm versus the other? who lives longer, mm -hmm. one treatment arm versus the other. So there are tissue samples that are probably potentially available from such studies from you know, many years ago. So you have long-term follow-up mm -hmm. of those patients. And you could probably validate your tool by looking at the tissue samples and determining whether that biomarker is present in the patients who seemingly benefited or not. Given the complexity of cancer, do you think a single target or a single pathway would be sufficient to, uh, to predict the response of a drug, a chemotherapeutic, or do you think it would be more complex? Well, I think it's the latter. So I think it would be uh, optimistic to think that a single tool is going to predict the, you know, more broadly the outcome of a patient. Uh, the question was specifically with respect to a drug, but I think particularly when you have patients who have been more heavily pretreated over time, they have a variety of different you know, signaling pathways that account for the behavior and the tumor is not homogeneous anymore, it's heterogeneous. So I don't think a single marker is necessarily gonna reflect everything that's going on in the tumor, but it's a start. Um, you know, it may be the dominant population of cells that account for what's going on, we don't know.